Product Manager and Developer Advocate for OpenShift project. OpenShift is a pass from Red Hat. Um, today in this session, what we will cover is how OpenShift can help enterprises uh, or uh, companies or um, uh, where you work to uh, provide with the repeatable process to have secure containers running your application. So we need to understand first of all what's containers, what's the containers technology and what it provides, so that's a technology introduction, and how a container can be run into a um, uh, distributed environment, so not only in a single machine but in at scale. So with orchestration tools. Then we will, I will tell you a little bit about OpenShift. I will try to be very light on the introduction for OpenShift. And then I will go a little into security con concerns that uh, Docker, which is the container technology that we use, uh, provides uh, at the moment, at the current moment, and what security constraints provides OpenShift to leverage its own uh, uh, features uh, to run uh, containers in a secure way in an enterprise. And then I will show you with all these uh, concepts how to build and deploy secure containers in an in a OpenShift environment. So technology interaction, what are containers? Containers is wh why we have hypervisors that uh, provides a logical or a logical abstraction to the whole operating system, to the whole machine, to the whole system providing abstraction of the hardware, the BIOS, and the operating system. Containers, on the other hand, runs on the same host, and it just provides a, a logical abstraction of the user space. So it reuses the same operating system as the host, but uh, in some way, it provides you with the isolation of uh, whatever you are running in, in the container. So that's, that means that we ship uh, uh, containers is packaging format for your application and all the dependencies that your application requires. So if you want to have a, an application deployed, uh, let's say for example a, a Ruby on Rails application, this uh, Ruby on Rails net needs to run in an application server, in a Ruby server. So you want to ship all of those in a packaging in, in a packaged way, so that that package will be isolated from whatever else is running on the, on the operating system. And also it's a, it's a, it's a, a format that allows you to provide with the same contents to all the environments where you are going to run the container. This is, a, this is allowed by some capabilities that the Linux, uh, that the Linux uh, kernel provides. So it's using control groups for uh, a resource constraining of your processes, so limiting the amount of memory or CPU or networking or IOPS that you want to allow your process to use, to consume. It's also using kernel namespace for process isolation, so it doesn't, it, um, doesn't mess one process with the other. Not only process isolation, but isolation to the host and the host capabilities, so providing isolation on the networking level or on the file system level or on the process uh, uh, share memory level. So there is a set of kernel namespaces that uh, containers use. And also it's using it, it's heavily relying on SLinux and experts for security considerations. Okay. So Docker, what's Docker? Docker is a format that has hyped a lot uh, recently and that has uh, brought containers into the a normal uh, community, community space. And Docker is just a packaging format for containers. So it uses the same technologies as any other con uh, Linux containers, but it provides a way of easily defining what will be into the container and it also defines the format to package all these, uh, your process and the dependencies that you will be running. Docker is uh, it's a company, but it's also a project that uh, that allows you to run containers and to create containers. And there is an engine 
that will run the, co the container and there is a, a there is the, the runtime they will run as a demo on your system and there is a CLI to interact with the, with the with this demo. There is also a registry that that will be where the images, where the container templates, which is the images, will be stored and uh, will be the source of all your application packages, all your image, container images. And there is one implementation of this registry, which is uh, notably uh, public or uh, it's uh, yeah, public and can be reused, and it's the Docker Hub where every user can publish their uh, images for sharing. And you can access and download your uh, already produced images from there. Docker is uh, really easy and it has oversimplified the use of uh, Linux containers. Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a, it's a project uh, led by Google that it's leveraging on the, all the experience that Google has on running containers as good because uh, Google has been running containers for almost uh, 12 or 13 years and they are running containers in a high, uh, in a high scale every day, so creating thousands or millions of containers every day and destroying uh, those containers every day. So Kubernetes what provides is to manage a fleet of Docker images in a scale environment. So it's uh, Docker is just for a single host, so it allows you to run containers on a single host and Kubernetes provides you with the ability of running those containers at scale orchestration those containers are probably are providing resiliency and high availability for the container. Okay, so OpenShift, what is OpenShift? OpenShift is a pass. A pass is a, a platform that allows at the end developers to create applications, but allows them just to focus on the application itself and not on the infrastructure that will run the application. So if a developer needs to create a a uh, web application running on, on Tomcat. Uh, they don't need to know uh, how Tomcat works, uh, how Tomcat is set up or configured in enterprise. They just go into a, into a, a web or with uh, CLI and they say, okay, I need a Tomcat instance. They create a click and they say, this is the source code that I want to run in my Tomcat instance and all the infrastructure, all the paths will take care of creating a new Tomcat instance or how many Tomcat instances that you need, build your application and deploy the application on top. So for from a developer perspective, uh, they only need to know about, um, about the application itself. So OpenShift at the end for a developer is like a black box because they don't need to know anything about how it works. They just need to know that there is something there. They go into a web, they click, uh, uh, I need a Tomcat with the database and they have everything set up. How many instances? They say, okay, two, three, and it will be created for them. But for operation and operation guide, it's a white box. Why? Because it allows you to see everything in OpenShift. So it allows you to monitor what's happening in there. Uh, it allows you to control how it happens things in OpenShift, where you want to run the things, uh, what, uh, where you want to run its type of workload. So it's very configurable for an operation, operational perspective. Uh, OpenShift is based on uh, or runs right now in a, a, a control host, so that means that you need, we need because it's relying heavily on, on, on the kernel on the kernel uh, container technology. It's running on Rail Atomic, uh, Rail Atomic host, which is uh, it's also probably the open source uh, the open source version is running on CentOS and, and Fedora as well. Which is uh, and the and the uh, atomic versions of CentOS and Fedora, because those are containers uh, or or technology that that's using the very uh, the Linux policies that we that we have uh, that we use. Okay, on top of that, it's using Docker for container packaging format and, and runtime. It's using Kubernetes for the orchestration layer, and on top of that, what really provides OpenShift on top of the open source project that, uh, that, we, that we use is a developer experience, a user experience for, um, for running containers at scale as, uh, uh, as a pass model. So it allows you to create uh, applications, it allows you to create uh, runtimes to run your applications, 
it uh, provides or, or enables you to do DevOps on your application, so do continue delivery with your application in a, in a very easy way. And it provides a set of already created or out of the box uh, uh, runtimes for applications. So the next pass is our middleware portfolio that's available in OpenShift. Yeah. Red Hat Atomic Host is a just enough operating system to run containers. So it's a, it's an operating system that's built with the, the minimal set of uh, of uh, requirements to run on top just containers. So it's uh, the Red Hat Atomic operating system as well as CentOS and Fedora. They uh, the software is not packaged as uh, RPMs. So it's uh, using um, an atomic way of uh, distribution <coughs> software. So it's there is a command which is atomic upgrade that it would provide you with all the updates from the upstream repository into your system and it would allow you to uh, create or to upgrade the system with just one single command and it will also allow you to roll back to previous version of the whole operating system. So the whole operating system is not is not managed independently all the packages that are there. It's just a single unit of the operating system. So uh, at the moment, the underlying technology, if you know, for example, in CentOS and Red Hat Enterprise, we have European <coughs> packages. In the Atomic version of CentOS, Atomic and Red Hat Enterprise, Atomic version, you are, well, there is a new thing called RPM OS3, which is something like, try to imagine, for example, RPM, because it's still RPM used to fetch that, but try to image, imagine, for example, that the file system is like a Git repository, and, and, then, and then all the packages are just like tagging a specific branch, for example. That's how, for example, you can upgrade everything on rollback to the previous version of the whole operating system. So it's a new way of you know, uh, managing the operating system itself, instead of individual package set. It's more like Gen 2 or something like... Well, not, well, I will not use Gen 2 as a comparison because yeah, nothing. Is, well, everything is pre-compiled, so you right. know... It's more like yeah. OS or, yeah. or Rancher OS and things like that. So and, and the main the main or the main uh, what why we can or why you can use uh, this kind of uh, packaging on your software is because this is just a, a, just enough operating systems to run containers. So it's not you are not going to install a lot of services in that. If you want to install services, you will use containers to run those services as containers on top. So if if on a on a Red Atomic host, if you want to run the HTTP uh, server. It will, it will, you will use it uh, or you will run it as a container. So you will pull down a container, the Docker run, in this case Atomic run, and it will run the HTTP server as a container. So you can then update your software as containers, doing a, a internally a Docker pool. So this is, this is, a, this is a OpenShift. Okay, so OpenShift uh, runs on any uh, hardware that you have or any uh, cloud that you want to uh, have or not any but most of them and we are still running so it runs on physical or virtual server it runs on public cloud or, or, or private cloud or even on hybrid cloud on top of that what we provide is a, is a, is a set of nodes that will run your 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 workloads so this is this is the where your applications will be running at the end and they are called nodes and then we have a set of uh, a set of uh, hosts that are dedicated for management purposes or for controlling all, all your operations. That they are called master nodes. In the master nodes, we have a we have a set of uh, of uh, processes managing and controlling OpenShift uh, infrastructure. So there is an API authentication that the, all the interaction between the clients and also between internal processes will happen uh, through an authentication and authorization level. Uh, layer, so everything will be will be airbag. So that means that the users will uh, will have need to have uh, their roles to execute uh, whatever action they are going to be executing. Also, the infrastructure will be also uh, authenticated. So if there is something happening here and it has to interact with OpenShift itself, will be um, access control. There is a data store to uh, store all the information that uh, resides in OpenShift, so all the configuration that, uh, that uh, OpenShift has, it's 
uh, at the end storing a highly available way that we can like it, it's CD uh, data store. And then we have we have uh, the concept of the service that well in, in the in the nodes we will run. Uh, it's not just containers, but it's containers packaged in a in a in a packaging format that Kubernetes provides that is called pod. And pods resembles in some way to the virtual machine in that every container usually is target for one process. The pod is a grouping of such containers in, as, as a single unit where these containers share some namespaces so they can see each other so they share the, the process namespace, they share the networking namespace so at the end there is one single IP on the outside of the pod, so the pod uh, just bound, binds to one IP, but internally all the processes will share the same the same uh, networking namespace. So if you have two different containers that are going to be using the same port, they will they will not start. Yeah, there will be a collision. Once you have these pods that are the applications, and typically in OpenShift or Kubernetes, you will use uh, one single pod application, one single container pod. You need to somehow uh, orchestrate those. So uh, your application will be a container and you will say, okay, I want my application to run in OpenShift. How many instances? Maybe I want three instances to be running there. How will they communicate between each other? Uh, so the communication between all of the internal pods in OpenShift will happen through a, an internal SDN. So there is a service layer, which is an SDN because in the cloud domain we need to have it uh, as a software-defined network to allow for this dynamism of creation and uh, destruction of IPs and, and resources. And all the communication between all these uh, applications will happen in, uh, through this service area. We have also in the master two uh, processes which are the scheduler. And the scheduler just will tell OpenShift where, where uh, to run the workloads. So that means that if I have an application that is target or is meant to be a front-end type of application, probably I have a set of nodes that are target to run those uh, those uh, workloads. So the scheduler, what we'll do is just try to find the best node where to run your application. So that means that in a highly uh, scaled environment, you will probably have dedicated infrastructure for maybe development, testing, and uh, staging production environments. You will also segregate with doing uh, front-end and back-end. Maybe you can also create dedicated uh, type of infrastructure for more performance on the I.O. Or, or depending on the workloads that you want to that you want to have. So at the end, the scheduler will, depending on, on what type of application you, you create, it will tell where to run that, that, that those uh, pods or those, those containers. And then we have the management and replication controller that it will guarantee that the amount of uh, pods or instances that you want to run, they will be up and running. So if you say, okay, I want this, uh, I want 10, 10 instances of my application to be running, if one of them fails down because uh, the node probably crashes or whatever, it will just say, okay, I, I needed 10, now I have nine, so it will try to start one new instance in one of the uh, available nodes for that uh, type of uh, workload. We also have a uh, persistent storage among all the all the uh, OpenShift infrastructure that allows us not only to run the typical uh, microservices type of application, but it allows us to run uh, more traditional or legacy type of applications that requires highly available uh, persistent storage. And we have an internal rate slip to store all our images all our uh, all the, the images that you will be creating into this infrastructure. Um, okay, just one yep. question regarding the registry. Um, which is actually the solution you use for the registry? Is Where it pulp? Pulp with crane no. or still the So that's that's in satellite, it's using pulp. But uh, internally in OpenShift we are using the uh, the Docker registry. The normal the hack version of the Docker registry. Yes to allow authentication and Yes, we have we have a, a, a version of the registry that allows us to do tenancy, for mm -hmm. example, because at the end this is a this is a multi-tenant environment, mm -hmm. so it allows you to have different user communities 
using this uh, this infrastructure, and they will not see each other. They there will be no interaction between each other. There is a uh, three ways of deploying applications in OpenShift. So one is from a Docker file. You have an application that's uh, written in a, in a Docker file. What OpenShift will do is get your Docker file, build your Docker file into a container, ship that uh, container image into the registry, and then run, create as many instances as you, as you have configured, uh, as, you have, as you have configured uh, from that image. There is a different uh, way of um, creating applications, and it's more targeted for typical developers, and it's where you have the developer creating the application in the traditional language, in Java, Ruby, Perl, whatever language they, they use, and they don't, they don't need to know anything about the runtime that they are using. So there is a special special builder images, Docker images, that what they will do is just connect to the repository where your application is living, so GitHub repository, for example, and it will get your application source code. If it's Java, it will get your Java application. It will build it, build it with Maven, probably, and it will deploy it on top of the runtime. So if you have an EAP that wants to a uh, uh, JBoss, uh, JBoss or Wildfly or or Tomcat, whatever type of runtime, it will get your Java source code, build your WAR file, your your web application archive, and then deploy it on top of a of a Wildfly application server. And then there is a third uh, way of uh, creating software or the play application on top of OpenShift, and it's a custom uh, builder. So that means that if the the ones that they are shipped out of the box doesn't fit your needs, you can create a builder image that is targeted for your custom way of working. So this way, you can create RPMs, for example. Okay. Uh, and when you want to deploy your application, what it will happen is that. The, re the registry is monitored. It's uh, uh, one of the things of the benefits we have it with our internal registry that there is a deep integration with OpenShift. So there is a, a venting of triggers happening between uh, the registry and, and OpenShift. When something, when a new image is pushed into the registry, if something is configured to, de to deploy as part of, of this new image, it will just deploy. And this is what we will see. Uh, I guess I have time for a demo. I will try to show you how we can create, a, we can recreate all our infrastructure if we create, a, if we deploy a new base, uh, base uh, container. Usually, if you work uh, with containers, if you are with Docker, if you have ever worked with Docker, you probably have downloaded an image from the Docker hub that somebody created, and you are running it in your host, uh, in your laptop, without any concern. You have to be aware that most. Many, uh, most of these uh, containers, probably 90% of these containers have security constraints. So if you run this container in your host operating system, you are probably um, uh, allowing uh, problems to happen. Okay. So this is you have to be aware about the circle of trust, which is coming from the uh, meet the meet the folder or the poker uh, movie, and this is where you are uh, where your the images are that you are getting from the from the OpenShift hub in the circle of trust. So you should not trust anything that's not in your circle of trust. That you don't know where it comes from. There is one project on the Docker on the Docker community that's Docker uh, Content Trust, Docker Notary, that allows you to sign all the images that you create. So uh, it guarantees that if you are using an image, if you get an update to that image, it's been created and signed by the same guy. So there is no potential for image forgery or replay attacks or key compromise. So, but this is not complete. Why? Because it's, it's, not, providing, it's not providing with the full uh, authoring control in the sense of once you have fetched an image, it will guarantee that that image is from the same source but it will not guarantee that if you have to trust somebody from the beginning, this will not allow it. And Docker also provides some SLX capabilities. You have to know that uh, this is probably most more on his topic. SLX is not namespaced, so everything that uh, runs in SLX runs unconfined, if I'm doing properly. So that means that the, the, the 
containers will run with a, a common policy, uh, which is called uh, LXC, NEP, uh, whatever, something. So everything that runs in a container runs with the same as a Linux policy. You can, when you are mounting a file system from the host into the containers, you can just tell them to provide with the appropriate as a Linux context with a capital set. It will provide with a, a dedicated context for its container. If you use a lower set, it will just provide, pro, provide a generic context for, for your uh, container. And then SVR in, in Docker. So every container gets a different NCSW, even if they have the same type of SMU enforcement. So that means that from a from a SLM or from an MCS or SV perspective, there will be different different levels for every container. So if you are running three different containers, even they are running with the same Linux context or the, the same as a Linux context, they have these different levels, so you will know which uh, which container is running. That's the more or less the only things that or the only integration that uh, has a, a Docker with the namespaces. So. You have to be aware that if you run or if you have root into a con in a container, you have root in the whole box. So this is something right now that uh, it's uh, still one of the main security constraints or considerations that you have to be aware, and that it's uh, probably preventing the explosion of containers into the enterprise because uh, many enterprise they want to be uh, or they need to have more security concerns. So what you should do, first thing, don't give root into a container, so usually uh, th this is one of the reasons why most of the things in, in the Docker Hub, uh, they are not secure because they are run, they are created with a root user, so that means that if you pull down an image from the Docker Hub and you just run it with probably, you know, uh, let's say an HTTP server and you want to bind it to, bind it to, a, to a low port, you will allow it to run as, as a as a privilege, that means that you will have you will provide it access to the host operating system because it's running root root in the guest. It will run root in the host and it will be it will probably have access to your home box. If you don't, if you have it, if you if you have to give root to your process instead of being root, just provide a looks like root. That means that allow all the capabilities with uh, uh, with uh, set capabilities. To have all the access to the operating all the access to the operating system that it needs, but not complete access to the operating system. And if that's not enough, just provide another wall, maybe through virtualization. Uh, so actually, it don't want to. Everything in, in Linux is not main space, as we said. So currently, Docker uses five main spaces to alter the process of the process view of the system. So that's the, the pin, the net the mount, the UCS, the hostname, and the shared memory. So there is things like uh, access to devices, which is not, not namespace. There is uh, SE Linux, which is not namespace, and many other things that eventually get, will get more uh, confined, more namespace, more uh, better secure. Okay? What OpenShift provides uh, uh, with respect to security? It provides you with authorization policies, so every interaction that happens to the, with the system, it happens through an authenticated API, an authorization API. That means that you have uh, users using your platform, you have system users, which is uh, users that are, um, are part of the internal operations of your OpenShift uh, infrastructure, so like a building, it happens with a, with a system user. So everything, everything that runs in OpenShift runs with a user, even uh, uh, whether it's a, a normal user like yourself interacting with OpenShift or the internal processes running in OpenShift that will have a user. And for all these users and service accounts, we have authorization policy. We have a cluster-wide authorization policies that will allow you to act upon the whole cluster and every project, every, 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 every project uh, that you have in OpenShift it will have local policies defined for that project. So you can have a user that for certain projects can do a lot of things, but outside of that project cannot do anything. 
what else do we, do we provide? So we provide with security cons context constraint, and yeah, this is the, the way of allowing the container to interact with the, uh, on the Docker security uh, configuration. So this is, this is uh, allowing the container to run as privilege or providing capabilities to the container, the use of host directories, uh, the use of uh, any system, uh, user ID, or the use of certain host namespaces. So when you create a, when you create a, when you run or when you run OpenShift, you have a certain security context constraint defined on the system, so that uh, will be a grouping of these uh, considerations. And when you schedule uh, some workload to run in, in OpenShift, it will define what capabilities or what, what constraints it needs. Uh, so the, the process of uh, running that workload into OpenShift will, will uh, check that whatever the container needs, it's provided by the security context constraint by which the container will run. And also we have secrets that allows you to provide with certificates, username, password, uh, Docker config files, whatever, into the containers in a, in a, in a, in a secure way. So it's, it's, uh, those files are, are, uh, uh, are encrypted. Sorry? Yeah, encrypted. It's a kind of a vault, a vault store yeah. so that are encrypted, those files are encrypted and are, are accessible on the, only to the, uh, are encrypted on the host and are accessible only on the, on the container itself in certain locations. Okay, so habits to take into account when writing containers when running in OpenShift. So drop privileges as quickly as possible, run your services at non root, whenever possible, treat root within a container as if it's root outside the container, so be very aware, and don't run, run the Docker instead of your system. So when it comes to a normal company when you want to run containers, usually what you do is just use the base because uh, containers, what it does is uh, use layers on top of uh, or create, provides you with a template that you can stem that's uh, using layers. So the basic usage will be to have whatever is provided by a secure source, which will be CentOS or REL in case of uh, Red Hat. And on top of that, you will probably provide with all your considerations for your for those containers, all the additional packages that you want that container to have, or if there is a certain user that you want to provide for all the configuration, all the connectivity maybe to your management platform, whatever, you probably have it into a, into a second or an additional layer on top of that. And then what you do is create your applications layer on top. So every application that you create in your company is based on this in your company profile container. So that means that if you update the company profile uh, container, it will update all of, or it will update all the applications that rely on that uh, company profile container. And for that, OpenShift, what it provides you is with the ability to easily update all your running infrastructure if you upgrade your base container. So. Let's say that you have a CentOS, and then on top of CentOS, you have uh, your additional packages installed, and you realize that one of those of that packages is uh, vulnerable, vulnerable to some uh, to some uh, uh, vulnerable to something, and you want to update it. So what you do is just create a new version of that image and let all the infrastructure rebuild itself and redeploy itself on top of the new version of your operating system or of your image. So that means that at the end of the day you will probably have everything in your infrastructure patched. Okay, this is what typically and traditionally you would use uh, your, uh, your configuration management tools. There is in OpenShift there is no need anymore for configuration management at the container level itself. Of course at the infra level you will still need to provision new nodes when you, when you are adding infrastructure, physical infrastructure or virtual infrastructure. So, as a developer you, uh, or as a, as a company, you will create this standard base image, what I call the corporate image. Uh, you will code whatever you need in that and you will just 
build that image and publish that image into your internal registry. So from there on, you can have your normal developers creating their applications on top of that corporate image. Once, once the developer creates, creates their application and pushes their code into it, what it will happen is that OpenShift will rebuild that image, taking into account your corporate base image, and then deploy it into OpenShift to for running. If you update your standard base image, that means that you have probably applied a pipe to the base image. What will happen is that operations, they will, the picture is good, sorry, they will update the, the, the base image, they will push it into the, the new code that creates that base image into the internal repository, SCM, and OpenShift will, will build it and it will update into the registry that image. Once that image is pushed into the internal registry, because you have uh, auto automated deployments, at least usually for uh, development environment, what it will happen is that all the application that rely on that image, it will get revealed and it will get ready for it with the new version of the innovation. Okay, and I have a demo if you want to, to see it, uh, or if not, then you can do questions on we can do questions on answers because I've run over time, but I don't know, no, I don't know what's. We, st we started later than scheduled, so it's up to you to decide uh, the demo. Okay, I will do a little demo. Um, so this is this is the this is the oh, you are not seeing anything. Okay, this is, this is the, the OpenShift console. So I'm, right now I'm, I'm into a project and what I have is just created a one base image. Uh, I'm going back to the presentation. What I have. What I have here. Okay, so I have. Create the base image, okay, or uh, I'm using the base image. For that, I have created a, an additional uh, company image or co corporate profile image, which adds some additional software, probably environment variables, configuration, whatever, and then I have an application relying on that. So, what I will do, what I will show is that how I, I have it set up that if I update my image, all my applications, in this case, is that one, but it will get updated eventually. So once I make a change here, I will have, within time, probably in one minute or so, I will have a new version of my application that re relying on the updated version of the base image. So right now, if I go to, uh, to the console, I don't have anything yet. Well, I have I have deployed I have deployed these uh, two base images. So there's uh, if we see the builds that I have, I have two images. I have two images. I have the image which is the base, and I have the corporate image. What I will do is just create a right now I will create an application that's relying on the. Uh, this is a sample application that you don't have to do anything. <coughs> right now I'm deploying an application as a developer using that, that, that image. So what, what is happening right now is that it will it's creating or building my application on top of that image and it will deploy. So my application is currently configured to have three instances running. And you can see it uh, you can see it in here, the clients. So this is what it will get deployed. And it will have three instances running. That means that I will have three applications or three versions of the same application running in the OpenShift uh, cluster, in the OpenShift domain. Okay. 
you can see it here. So the first process that is happening is building my application. Once my application is built, it will deploy my application. So building depends on the, on the networking, it will take more time. <laughs> and here is the... Let's see my pen. Okay, there is no, I don't have internet connection, so I can uh, okay, So maybe it's trying to build, but it's not connecting to the internet, and it's failing. Anyway, you should be able to trust me. <laughs> we do. Okay. Um, what happens is that you have a, you have a uh, running application. If I update the, basic, the base application that I, that I was using, it will rebuild my base, my base image. It will push it into the registry. Once that image is pushed into the registry, all the images that depend on that base image will get rebuilt and get redeployed with the updated version of the base image. And that without uh, any concern for the, for the operator. So that means that eventually, within time, probably in, 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 a, in a real environment, in a development environment, you will have everything updated within minutes. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.